Thank you so much. And it's so exciting to be here. And um, I'm so uh, happy that you have a sign lang language interpreter. But I do need to tell the interpreter, I do speak sometimes a bit too fast. So if I do speak a bit too fast, just kind of say, slow down, Rory, because I've had a lot of coffee. Um, and I'm uh, calling from uh, South Africa, which actually has the largest expat Indian community in the world, um, which is, uh, yeah, it's, it's a great, great uh, kind of, we're sister countries to you. Um, Gandhi, Mahatma Gandhi actually did his law uh, in, uh, in Durban in South Africa. So we, we have a, a huge history uh, with the Indian community. I'm so happy to be able to tell you about this story for programming with accessibility. So follow me on Twitter. Um, I do a lot of updates, accessibility updates, and also do Azure updates. In my day job, I'm actually a, a Microsoft Azure and Java advocate. And I also do uh, accessibility because the Microsoft uh, uh, advocates believe that they need to become the change that they want to see in the world. That's a good Gandhi quote that if you want to you want to know about that. Um, and uh, this this is all about you know how innovation this talk can lead to increased revenue. And I know what you're saying, Rory, uh, but you're talking about uh, accessibility. What has it got to do with money? But we believe at Microsoft that if you program for everyone then you create innovation and innovation will actually lead to more customers and better revenue. And we've got proof of that. Now, that's really what I'm going to tell you and show you as we progress through this um, presentation. So a little bit about me. So I've got brown hair, I've got glasses, I'm wearing a white shirt and I'm speaking at my home office. Now I have uh, something called achondroplasia or uh, dwarfism, um, and I'm short. I'm four foot one. Uh, that's 120 uh, centimeters to the the people who who don't use feet. Um, and uh, I uh, need a lot of adjustment in my life to be able to uh, do certain things that other taller people could do. For example, uh, this is my car, and I've got car pedals here. Uh, and I bolt on those car pedals. This is done by a mechanic uh, uh, company that works with wheelchairs. And it's bolted onto my car pedals, you can see there, to be able to use the accelerator and the brake. And it's similarly with uh, other aspects of my life uh, like this. I have to uh, use a chair to jump on to be able to uh, reach certain things. And sometimes I even have to, you can see that there is me trying to get coffee. I have to be able to uh, get up onto the uh, counter sometimes to be able to get uh, coffee. The problem with bolting on accessibility is that just like software, if you bolt on things and you try to fix stuff in production, um, then you're going to give birth to bugs. And one of those bugs is uh, it can be best described as the hydra. Now, the Hydra is a mythical Greek, uh, or I think it's Greek, medieval uh, creature that if you chop one of the, the heads off, then another one just grows immediately up. And we've seen this now with software development. If you create uh, and you fix a bug in production, then you really are going to create more as, as you progress. And it's the same with accessibility. So um, what we've noticed is if you don't fix accessibility in the beginning stages of your application and cater for all of your users, then you're going to give birth to the hydra. So I have a plan today that we're going to pop the empathy bubble and we're going to look at ways to slay the hydra. So important to understand what the empathy bubble is. Now, the empathy bubble is a universe that every human being lives in there. So if you understand how the universal expansion happens, I was reading recently um, by one of the physicists um, uh, that said that the universe didn't expand from a single uh, dot uh, of, uh, of, um, of matter. It actually expands every second from every uh, dot of matter, quantum quantum mechanics. So theoretically, you're at the center of your universe right now, and the universe is expanding around you and uh, and 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 going outwards. So as a result, we all live in these universes, in these empathy bubbles, and we don't understand how reality is for each individual person. For example, 
I'm using a, a, a wireless keyboard, a presenter, a trackpad, and a mouse because I can't reach my laptop on a good day because I have very short arms. And you might not be able to experience that for me. So when you design a product for me, you might not uh, design it for someone who has such short arms. But for example, most people who have cars uh, can't actually use the cars that they're in because most cars are actually engineered for men. But there's more women in the world than, than men. So uh, I'll give you a little bit of a history behind the empathy bubble. So in the 1920s and 30s, the U.S. Army was starting to design cockpits for, uh, for cars, uh, sorry, for airplanes. And they took 4,000 people and they adjusted the airline to be able to, the aircraft, to be perfect for the average of that 4,000. The problem with that is that that average person didn't exist. That person was a manifestation, a creation in their head. So then they started flying those planes and people started crashing. And they brought back some people and they said, sit down here, is it comfortable? And they said, no, it's, it's terribly uncomfortable. What do you need? We need you to adjust it for all of those 4,000 people because each one lives in their own bubble for their uh, credentials. Now, that, as a result, instead of bolt on like I did for my car pedal, they created these steering wheels that it allowed you to adjust it uh, through and from and your seat that we have today in cars. So the empathy bubble doesn't exist in a car because people realized that they had to cater for everyone. And that's how also they brought in innovation into a lot of the engineering disciplines. But we're in software. So we're going to look at exactly how to do that and how to pop the empathy bubble with software. Because if we don't, we're going to design software similar to this where that Hydra is created right at the end there. You see they had good intentions. And then at the end, they were going to create a wheelchair ramp where people can't actually use. I've got a plan today. I want to define accessibility, what it is and what it isn't. We're going to understand motivators, so legislation, and also uh, how to create compassion, the stick and carrot. We're going to look at uh, interim milestones and set achievable milestones. And then finally, we're going to implement tools. And tools need to be able to measure. Uh, you, you have to measure with tools to actually make them well, and you, you've got a hypothesis. In Microsoft, we use hypothesis-based uh, uh, testing to say the tool is working. So we're going to go in, and finally, we're going to measure, improve, and automate using those tools, using an agile methodology uh, and DevOps. So what is accessibility? And this is a key differential because accessibility is not disability, and I'm going to define disability after this. Accessibility is the design of product services environments so that everyone, including people with disabilities, can fully experience them. Remember that car uh, and the plane metaphor? We didn't design for the average. What we did then is we designed for every one of those 4,000, slowly adjusting there to be able to cater for everyone's requirements. And once we have that with inclusive product and service design, we'll need, uh, we will also include compliance because we do need a, an element of uh, stick and carrot because you need to comply to government regulations. It will increase your productivity and also innovation. Now, Elon Musk, when he created Tesla and he was looking for software engineers, do you know what he did when he, he created that advert? He said, we do not need engineers who understand vehicles. We need good software engineers who understand software. Because he understood that they, these engineers knew about uh, inclusive product design, which would lead to good co uh, vehicle compliance, productivity, and innovation. And recently, it was the largest car company announced with a trillion dollars worth of evaluation in a few years. So what is disability then? Disability is not a personal health condition. You don't go to the doctor and say to him, oh, I'm feeling so bad. He goes, yeah, I think you've got the disability. The only time that you really feel disabled is when you have a mismatch human interaction. So I've got a, a BMI scale, a scale that actually measures my body mass index. And I jumped onto it and I, I put in my, my uh, kilograms. So I'm, right now I'm 50 kilograms, but at that time I was 65 kilograms. I've been dieting pretty successfully recently. And I entered my heart, 120 centimeters or four foot one. And then I, uh, th they had a crawling baby 
and a very tall adult. And I thought, I'm not a tall adult. I'm I'm closer. I'm like the, the heart of a six-year-old. So let me put the, the baby there. And I, I put the baby there and I jumped onto it. Uh, and you have to be barefoot because it measures your, uh, your BMI. And uh, then it, it did its little calculation. You could see that it had an AI there going, and it did a calculation. And it called me terrible names afterwards. It said, you are bleep, 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 bleep. And I thought, oh, my gosh. And I felt disabled. Because I realized that the people who had designed that product hadn't actually thought about me. I didn't fit into their, their, their classification of what normal was. But there are other people who would also afford it. But so they didn't actually cater for accessibility. So as a result, they made me feel disabled. And I never used that product again after that because I don't want to feel disabled when I use a product. And it's the same as when you use uh, other products. Uh, you, you're going to not only lose your customers, but you're going to actually hurt your customers. So what is accessibility when we define it now with compliance? So there's WCAG, which is Accessibility Design Principles. And it, does, it defines four main principles that you need to know. So the WCAG uh, process right now is in uh, the 2.1, so the version 2.1, and it goes into A, AAA, and AAA. We're going to define uh, 2.1 AA compliance, and we're going to look at how to test with that. So the easiest way for me to show you what WCAG, which is Web Center for Accessibility Guidelines, is, is to say that there's only four principles. Perceivable. Can you see it? I wear glasses. It's got a little blue tint there because my eyes, my eyes get uh, strained. And also, I have a little less eyesight on my right eye. I have astigmatism. But that means that I need to be able to see certain text, certain font, and, and other things. But you also have visual impairment people, people who are... Uh, blind, visually impaired, and men who are one out of every 20 men are colorblind. So you need to be able to have a principle uh, of design perceivable. Next, operable. Can you use it? Now, if uh, I take a website and I switch off my mouse, I should be able to use that website with my keyboard. But most keyboards, uh, most websites can't be you, you, they, because they, they go in and they change the tab index and they forget to update it. But operable, can you use it, is also for uh, mobile devices. As you know, we've seen now a lot of mobile devices are now incorporating compasses and uh, accelerometers to be able to move your device around for you. So operable, can you use it? Understandable, can you understand it? Now, if I take my mouse pointer and I, I zip it around here, it's hard to see what I'm doing here. But it's hard to see. But for people who are in the autism or, or ADHD spectrum, neurodiverse, that actually can cause uh, problems. And if you have epilepsy, you know, you can trigger epilepsy. So understandable, understandable also includes neurodiversity. It means that people who have cognitive or neurodiverse uh, accessible requirements can also understand it. And finally, if you're going to change it for accessibility, you can't really change it and let it break later on. It won't break future technologies. So remember responsive design. If I have a phone and I change it from portrait to landscape, now, that's an accessible feature because most uh, people who have accessible requirements actually use their phone in landscape, not uh, portrait. So if you do that, it's a great way to say that now it won't break your website or your application. So those are the four principles. Now, let's look at motivators. Now, we've got two key motivators. We've got stick, which is I'm going to hit you with compliance and legislation, and then carrot which is, yes, a nice reward for you, and thank you so much for doing the right thing. So what's the easiest one you think that uh, people want to follow? Now, they follow both. They follow legislation and also uh, and, and altruistic with uh, carrots. And that's just the way that human beings work. Look at GDPR. Look what it, it did to the internet, and suddenly now people realize that they can't store data, that they're not allowed to store. So introducing the U.S. 21st Century Digital Experience Act, and also coupled with the EU Parliament Directive on Digital Accessibility that says by this year, you have to be compliant. We're CAG 2.1 AA compliant. Or like Canada is starting to do, if you have a civil facing website, a government's website, or a, 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 one of their local websites, you get a $100,000 fine per day. That's your end of your company and possibly jail time. Now that is bigger 
right now than GDPR because they're shutting down companies right now. But I don't like to think it's only legislation that is going to make people change to be uh, accessible. I also like to think that there is a quality of life and a carrot that we can offer. And best summed up by Bill Gates' quote, for most of human history, we put our innovative capacity in improving the quantity of life. More, 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 supersize, more, more, more. Because we're living longer, our focus is starting to shift towards improving the quality of life. But to understand the quality of life and to improve others' quality of life, you need to be aware of others' difficulties. So instead of going from pity, we use sympathy, we aim for empathy, and then we reach compassion. And we do this by understanding that empathy bubble and the hydra. And we do this by understanding the people that use our systems. So these are the persona spectrums created by the UK government. And I'm going to introduce you to Ashley, a 24-year-old arts graduate and administrative assistant. She's severely slight impaired. She's blind. And she uses a screen reader. Now, what you do in using these persona spectrums, which are freely available on that URL over there, you create these labs, these persona labs to become that person. So instead of popping that bubble, what you do is you enter into that bubble, you step into that person's bubble, and you become Ashley. So Ashley can't use her site, so now you use your navigation keyboard. You set up all of your, your setup to be able to do that, and you can use all of those personas that you can access there. Now, once you understand how your personas work, now you can actually use inclusive design. So recognize exclusion is the first step. You need to understand that you don't cater for Ashley and you are uh, creating an empathy bubble. You want to solve for one, extend to many. Now, Ashley is the same spectrum as me. I need glasses. But Ashley also is in the same spectrum as the silver generation, the generation over 70. Now, that's a generation that has a trillion dollar spend per year. And that's just Americans. So as a result, to exclude people like Ashley, you're actually excluding who have sight impairment, the, tri the trillion dollars that your revenue could have with your system. That's a lot of money. And once you have that, you learn from diversity. If you exclude Ashley, maybe you're excluding other personas. Let's look at another example. So here we have an amputee, someone who has limited use of their arm. They might have been born with an arm or might have lost their arm. Now, they're in the same spectrum as someone who has an arm injury and also in the same spectrum as someone who is in the new parent. Now, I know what you're saying. A new parent is not, he doesn't have any accessible requirements, but I've been a parent. I've got two kids. Now, when you're cradling your newborn in your arms, you're both uh, mentally, physically, spiritually, financially sleep deprived. You have accessible needs. But if you go to your stakeholders or your manager and you say, I want to cater for just that person with one arm, he's going to say to you, the U.S. Center for Statistics says that there's only 26,000 people in the U.S. with uh, that type of accessible requirement. But the temporary disability has 13 million and the situational disability has 8 million. That means if you cater for that one persona spectrum, you have 21 million. Now, when we look at everyone who has accessible requirements, there are a billion people in the world who have accessible requirements. When you take friends, families, loved ones who are both financially and also mentally uh, invested in those individuals, that's three and a half billion people. That's nearly half the world. So to not cater for these persona spectrums and to accessibility is exclude half the world from being able to use your products and services. You take your personas. And now you superimpose them over your journey work. So this is a journey that I created for the IATA conference for airlines in Emirates. They flew me over there. And I said to them, okay, normally you've got registration, navigation, and checkout processes. And in registration, you've got your site landing, your registration, your login. You're going to search flights. You're going to add to cart. And you're going to check out, get your ticket. And you're going to do a survey that you may or may not uh, see the results of to say whether the experience was good or not. But watch what happens when I superimpose my uh, persona spectrum onto that. You get responsive design to make sure that all devices can use it. You have a capture for registration to aid people who can't type. You have accessibility help desk. You have single sign-on. You have one-button access, voice search, 
callback help, SMS and email. And then finally over that, you actually tell them, wait a second, did you have uh, a good experience? If not, you adjust your entire process using AI to cater for that person. What? How do I do that, Rory? I'm going to show you in the tools how to use AI to actually change the entire process to be accessible. Let's look at milestones now. Now, so this is a typical system delivery life cycle, and in this life cycle here, you can see there we've got the start of the uh, UX research, and then the UX design, where we create a wireframe for a product that may or may not be accessible. And then the UX research will go through multiple iterations there to look at uh, how to improve that wireframe. After that, we go look at the product backlog and add each of the product requirements into a sprint backlog. And in the sprint, we have a sprint and a scrum, and we rinse and repeat that until we have a shippable product. And then we ship that product, and do you know who that is there? That's the Hydra because we've just given birth to an accessible Hydra there because we've never included the personas and the journeys throughout the entire process. And right now, that Hydra is going to live on forever. So what we need to do is we need to shift left. So the shift left movement is actually a very old movement, even from the 60s, called uh, a test first development. And it even comes back to that airline example that I gave you that says, rather than a large investment right at the end, have small investments throughout the process to make sure that the uh, bugs or the hydra right at the end will not uh, be born. So as a result, you've got small investments throughout the process in your testing, coding, design, and backlog. And then there is no Hydra. And this is what it looks like. So on your UX research, you include accessibility. On your UX design, accessibility. Your wireframe, accessibility. Your product backlog and your sprint backlog, you include accessibility and you can actually go in and create an agile process to be that. And then the shippable product, do you see what's missing there? There is no Hydra because you've killed it throughout the entire process. And we do that with tools. So I'm going to equip you with using open source tools to be able to do this. And I, and I get a lot of queries around this. Rory, this is really hard to do normally. And it's not meant to be done normally. You're meant to actually partner with a company that understands accessibility. And I use accessibility every single day. I actually create content on Microsoft Docs and Learns. And that content is chucked over to the fence to our accessibility tools. And they help me understand that using AI and rules to be accessible. And the most important tool that I can tell you about today is accessibilityinsights.io. So accessibilityinsights.io. And this is a tool that uses an engine that one of our partners have uh, called the X uh, engine by DQ Labs. And it allows you to test all of your software using the same rule set. So you can include CICD for DevOps. You can include it with GitHub Actions, which we just launched. You can also do it for Windows, for web, and also for Android. Now, what does this actually do? It allows you to take, and this is the, uh, the GitHub Actions, um, the Maven version. So I'm a Java developer, so I've used Maven to go in and test my site. And I created a test report using uh, the accessibility actions. And you can access that on github.com forward slash dqlabs forward slash X dash core dash maven dash HTML. It also allows you to run GitHub Actions out of the box. You can see there, that's my accessibility action. Now, I didn't have to do a custom CI CD uh, tool chain to do that. I just ran that uh, insights action against HTML pages. And then I've got my accessibility checks. Uh, you can see there, I've got some pass and some fails. And that's available on github.com forward slash Microsoft forward slash accessibility dash insights dash actions dash actions, sorry, not actions. So now we slay the Hydra, but there are times that you will not be able to change your entire process to an agile process. And I've seen a lot of people saying, I've got a legacy website, I've owned it for 20 years now, I can't go and make it accessible. So introducing the immersive reader. 
So the Immersive Reader is available on all of Microsoft products and the Edge browser. And what the Immersive Reader does is it actually takes a website, a tool, a Microsoft doc, and creates a WCAG compliant experience. So this is Microsoft Teams or OneNote. You can see that you just click on the Eclipse, you go to Immersive Reader, and you've got an immersive experience, a WCAG 2.1 compliant experience. Now I'm gonna show you in the demo how to do this and add this to a website using a little bit of code and uh, the Azure services that's gonna cost you cents per year to run this. I've only paid two cents the entire year for my immersive reader. And it gives you the ability to change into any language. Today, we're gonna to read in Hindi and we're gonna take a website and adjust it and we're gonna see if we can actually get the right pronunciation. You're gonna tell me about whether it does speak back well in Hindi. We're going to translate to 60 different languages, but there's more. We've just updated to 100 different languages. You've got pronunciation, syllables, and pictures. And this is great. This is part of our learning tools that we give to students. Because as a result, we gave this to students, and we realized that the silver generation and people who needed uh, language help also benefit from this. So because we looked at innovation and compliance with accessibility, we now can cater for a little button on, on websites, on the millions and billions of websites out there that can not only make an, uh, an accessible experience, but translate to one of a hundred different languages. And once you have that also, you understand the power of AI. Now you can take computer vision, you can scan your pictures and you can create alt tag images here. So here's an alt tag, it says Satya Nadal, Bill Gates, Steve Ballmer, posing for a photo. And we won the challenge that Facebook put out the no caps challenge that said that we can actually caption better than a human being. And you can caption all your images and your, your Microsoft Office documents better than anyone can. So now I've got a demo. I've got plenty of time. I've actually got 29 minutes to do all of these demos. Um, and first thing I want to show you is how to do uh, what I just did now in Microsoft PowerPoint to do subtitles, which is very important. So you can actually see my screen here. And I've got subtitle settings here. And it's built into that. And I've got English US. And all I did was uh, make sure it's gone below uh, slide there. And then I just did uh, always use subtitles. And you'll switch on subtitles and allow you to do it in any way. But you can also take the subtitle settings here and change it to one of many different languages. And Hindi is one of them. So I could have actually spoken to you in the subtitles uh, throughout. The organizers did say to me U uh, US English. But I have done it before for an Indian audience in Hindi. Then let's look at with Microsoft Office. And if you've got this picture here, now if I go and edit the alt text, now a screen reader wouldn't be able to see exactly what's there, but I use an Azure Cognitive Service in the background, all Microsoft the services use that. So if I go generate a description for me, it's gonna go use that image description. Remember we're the best in the world with this. And it says a person typing on a keyboard. No more, no less, easy to understand. And a screen reader can understand that. And there's so many more services that are built into the Office products. But I want to show you some programming features here. So first, let's go to our website. So this is the w3.org, the Web Accessibility Initiatives demo. And it's a before and after demonstration. It's a City Lights website. It's a tourism website that has been created both inaccessible and also accessible. Now, if you look at the inaccessible version, the accessible version looks exactly the same. Because what they've done is they've done terrible HTML practices to be able to create the inaccessible version. So a screen reader software or an accessible uh, assistive tool can't actually use it. So for example, in the inaccessible version, if I tab through that, I don't go anywhere. If I go through to the accessible version and I tab through it, you can see there I'm tabbing through correctly. If I look at the images for the inaccessible version, it just says image. That's not gonna help me. And, and it needs to explain the image. And if I look at the HTML here, if I go and inspect the HTML, they've used BR tags instead of list item tags. It's not even a, a list, it's just they've used space tags and that's gonna break a screen reader software. How do, I, how do I do all of this? 44 errors on this page right now. How do I determine all of these errors and, and determine how to fix them? So. On the top right-hand side here, I've got a little button called uh, Accessibility Insights for Web. Now, this is available in Chrome and Edge. You can go install it now and in the Chrome store. So if you go here and you go uh, accessibilityinsights.io to that page that I said there, 
you can go in and you can go for uh, for web. Uh, you can click on for web, and then you can go add to Chrome or add to new, uh, Microsoft Edge. And it'll add if I click on uh, add to Chrome, it'll go to the Chrome store, and you'll add your uh, your Chrome view there, which I've already got. So I've got my accessibility insights, and you can see there I can switch on my landmarks. I can switch on my headings. I can switch off color. Uh, and I can switch on tab stops. So now I can actually test it with those personas and see, well, tab stops are wrong and maybe I'm using the incorrect color. So that's great for visual, but what happens if I wanna see those horrible HTML issues that they did there? So I've got the inaccessible version selected and now I can go in and select fast pass or assessment. Now, fast pass is meant to be a 10 second view of exactly what's going on to give you, hey, wait a second, how many errors you got? And then send it to your stakeholders and go, this is how many errors you're gonna need to fix. Very quick, it's meant, meant to be very, very quick. But you also have assessment. And if you wanna do a full assessment, you can. And this is a WCAG 2.1 compliant uh, success criteria. And it, it, it takes a little bit longer than the fast pass but you can export the results there. And that's for your testing team to make sure that you've got everything uh, under control. So let's go fast pass and let's find those 44 errors. Okay, I'm gonna run fast pass, 44 errors. Now it's got a visual helper, which we're gonna go to now. Now the color contrast is wrong and it shows you that you've used gray and, uh, and, and gray, gray on gray. That's not good color. I mean, people who have failing eyesight won't be able to see that. The lang uh, language is uh, not defined. So people who wanna read that with a screen reader uh, or, or captioning can't actually use that because they don't know what language they're reading. The alt tags are not defined and it gives you the WCAG feature there. So if I click through that, it will describe the WCAG feature here, understanding the su success criteria and description around it. It also tells you where to fix it and how to fix it. We also have the link names. So they don't have discernible text. So there's an AREF there that just doesn't have any link names. And finally, the select names, they don't have an accessible name. So I can go look at the HTML that, but I can also go see visually every issue that I have there. Now I can actually click on that image alt tag that I had there. And I can see there that there, uh, the description, where it is, I can inspect the HTML, I can copy the failure details, and, and gives me on how to fix it. And I can also file the issue straight to GitHub. Kill the Hydra before it even comes up. And you can see that there's all of those issues that are, are, are defined. So what about those tab stops? I did want to show you an end-to-end -end with the accessible there. So if I switch on tab stops here, now I can actually see exactly where I tab. I can take a screenshot of that and send it through to everyone to say the tab stops are working fine. So take this engine, this incredible engine made by our partners, DQ Labs. Now put it in a Maven, a uh, .NET, a Python, a Ruby project. Now I've got that project running right now and it's running in Visual Studio Code. And let me just open it here. And it's that URL that I sent you earlier. Now this is a Maven project and it goes through these unit tests and it checks whether the, the files are available with selectors. Uh, it also checks um, uh, DOM images, web elements, and you can run each one of these uh, in Maven or you can actually run these in GitHub Actions or a DevOps process. So I've got this entire project running in a DevOps process. So if I go here and I'm gonna open up uh, let's go to github, github.com. I'm gonna go into my uh, repositories here. Now GitHub Actions, I've got the standard uh, personal profile. It's $4 a month and I get unlimited, almost unlimited GitHub Actions. And you can see that there's the project, Axcore Maven. And I went in there and I just created an action that goes in and runs Maven projects. So if you wanna see what this looks like, I've got uh, Java CI with Maven, and I can just go in and uh, go into my view here. And it's gonna run a build process that's gonna set up my JDK, build and run the tests. 
And those are 41 tests that I ran into that project. Um, and it's going to say the test ran successfully and then complete the job. And then I get a test report. So every time I push to this project, I'm going to run it again now. Every time I push to this project, it's going to run the entire process with that X engine for accessibility insights. And it's going to tell me, is my HTML running co uh, correctly? Now you can do this with .NET, PHP, Python, Ruby, all of these languages. You can access the DQ Labs and go in and get uh, those repositories. So DQ Labs has it. And also Microsoft actually has these, uh, these rules engines that you can use. So now we've got our, our, our little CRCD running. But what about immersive reader? Rory, you said to me, what happens if we have websites that we can't actually uh, access and, and change the HTML? Now you can change it with one button. So I'm gonna show you here. So I've got a little project that I created this week uh, and I call it Im uh, immersive reader for Java. And what it does, it takes some text here. It says It says here, the text is, Immersive Reader is a tool that implements proven technologies to improve reading comprehension for emerging readers. And then it's got a JSP page, which is a nice HTML for Java. And then it goes in and finds a token. Uh, I'm going to show you how to create that uh, for Immersive Reader. And then goes in and renders a button. You can see there, Immersive Reader render button. Now on my Azure uh, site, see it, it, it finished. You can see that it already finished the test report. That was qu quite quick. Um, on my Azure portal, I created an immersive reader object. And it's, I'm going to show you the cost with that. Now, the immersive reader object goes in and scans that text that I have on HTML and creates that immersive experience and that ability to change languages. So if I go into immersive reader, now I've run this immersive reader now for about a year. And I, I want to show you the cost equivalent for that. So if I go to cost analysis, and in that example that I showed you there uh, in the slides and I'll, uh, is the how to create an immersive reader, but it's pretty simple. You, you have a script to create it, and then you create a service principle that allows you to create the token for that. So if I go here, let's go see how much this costs in the last 12 months. That's, that's pretty lengthy. Now, this not only gives me the ability to do language changes, but also to create an immersive experience. And it cost me three cents for 12 months. And it's a million, it's, uh, you get one cent for every million characters that you actually translate. That's pretty impressive. So I've got my immersive reader, and then I just created a, a Tomcat application with my HTML in it. And the Tomcat application is on Azure App Service, and I'm hosting that there. And this costs me, I can do this for free, actually. It's on the free Linux tier. Uh, but I've got it a little bit more performant because I like to demo it with. Um, and uh, I've got it running on Tomcat. And you can run this for free. So you, th you think about it. You can create a, an immersive experience that costs you two cents per year uh, running on the free tier on Azure. Now I'm going to click through that, and it's going to give me that immersive experience. Immersive Reader is a tool that implements proven technology to improve reading comprehension. Now that's great, but it can also read those languages there if I wanted to. But I, I the, the, the font's a bit too small there. I want to click on, and you can see that Immersive Reader button there. So I'm going to click on the Immersive Reader button, and now it's going to create an immersive e experience for me. Uh, for uh, WCAG 2.1 compliant. Now you should be able to hear this. Um, I could put it louder though. Immersive Reader is a tool that implements proven techniques to improve reading comprehension for emerging readers. And I didn't have to change anything to make it uh, that experience. I can change it to male and female voice, increase the voice speed. I can change the font to bigger or smaller, the font size to Comic Sans, and also the grammar. If I'm not an English speaker, I can include the uh, adjectives, adverbs, labels, nouns, verbs. Now, when I go on to people and I click on that, I can actually get a visual representation. But I want to change the language here. So I can, and now I'm going to go change the line focus to give me a Amazon Kindle kind of experience. I've got my picture dictionary. Now I'm going to go into Hindi. I'm going to find one of the hundred different languages and I'm going to go into Hindi. And I'm going to translate the whole document without any real work. I now have immersive reader. Times kam se kam parne wale drishya mein samagri dikhata hai. Times aam toh par. Or enter male voice. Par istemal kiye jane wale shabdon ki tasveere prat. 
And we're seeing more and more customers take that uh, that button and put it on nearly all of their websites because what they realize now is through innovation and being accessible and catering for people who uh, are WCAG compliance. They now allow people to use languages that they never thought they could have, though. You can take this with Immersive Reader and you can speak to Icelandic, to Hindi, to Spanish, to any language that you can think of because we support more than 100. So that's all the demo that I wanted to show you, the ease of use of this. And this website here, I'm running it on the free tier. I could run it on the free tier right now. It's a little bit performant because I'm demoing it. But I can run it on the free tier on uh, eight, uh, Azure. It wouldn't cost me anything. And also it cost me two cents to run the Immersive Reader. So we still have a little bit more time, which is great for questions. So finally, I want to uh, give you a, a call to action. We've shown you today how to actually pop that empathy bubble and kill that Hydra. And we've shown you what is accessible and how to define accessibility and disability. We've also shown you how to shift left using DevOps processes, using tools that allow you to actually go in and constantly test your tools and also using persona spectrums to be able to test using the actual users that uh, use your system. And finally, automation with AI. We've seen that AI is really the next evolution of accessibility testing and gives so much innovation and creates revenue. I can take that button now and pop it onto any of the websites and I can reach audiences that I never had before and increase my revenue. So I've got a challenge for you today. Get the Accessibility Fundamentals badge. It'll take you a few minutes. You can go to aka.ms, accessibility-fundamentals. You get a badge linked to your profile on Microsoft Learn. So this is an accredited badge that you can get. So aka.ms forward slash accessibility-fundamentals. And you'll learn everything that I've shown you today and more that will allow you to actually go in and become accessible. And finally, rate my session, please. Uh, and uh, I feedback to the people who create these systems. Microsoft PowerPoint, these subtitles, I feedback to the actual uh, team that creates these subtitles. So please rate my session, send me a message, follow me on Twitter also, uh, let's go the final day, on Rory Petty, and reach out to me um, and tell me what your accessible journey is about. But definitely, let's start with that badge and you can get the M365, the programming, and a lot of the other features about uh, what is WCAG and all of those features with accessibility dash fundamentals. Thank you so much. We do have 13 minutes left for questions. And thank you, Eunice, for the excellent sign language interpretation.